Hi there, welcome to iBiology. My name is Malte Paulson. I'm taking care of the flow cytometry facility here at EMBL in Heidelberg. It's my pleasure today to give you an introduction into flow cytometry, which will be a brief introduction how this actually works in terms of what the machine reads of it and what kind of data we'll get from these kinds of instruments. Now, flow cytometry itself is a very interesting technology because what you have actually here is an instrument that can, or technology that can actually analyze many different parameters from the same cell at a very, at a very quick pace and at the same time. So it is one of the principal methods in bio, biomedical research. So let's have a look what flow cytometry is actually all about. So the topics that I'm going to discuss today is actually the way how a flow cytometer works. We're going to discuss a little bit about fluidics, so the hydrodynamic focusing principle. We're going to spend quite a lot of time actually talking about the optics, how this is all done, detecting the light, actually how it is uh, transferred into a clear signal that is machine readable. And in the end, we will also talk quickly about compensation, of course, also displaying the data. All of this is very important, but I'll try to keep it very simple so that everybody can understand and grasp the principles. So let us get started. The first thing that we have to think about is fluidics. Now in the flow cytometer, we're looking pretty much as a system that runs a river. Similar to a river that we have here, for example, is in perfect conditions, this river will always flow at a certain motion with a certain volume per time. And this is actually what we're doing in a flow cytometer. We are having a system which runs with a laminar flow, transporting forward a certain volume in a certain time. So we always have constant speeds. Now fluids are perfect for this because they're very difficult to compress. So when we apply a pressure to it and keep the pressure constant over time, we're also having a constant flow. So if we take this into the reality, so in most flow cytometers, we have our sheath tank actually that holds a uh, iso tonic solution of salts, which our cells enjoy and where they actually are very happy in. And we actually have a closed system, we apply some pressure to it. This can be either pressurized air or maybe even a pestle from a syringe. The only thing is the pressure needs to be stable over the whole volume. So and if we have an afflux from the system, like a tube or basically a flow, a flow curvet, we're generating in this small canal down here, a so-called laminar flow. Now, in case of a flow cytometer, this laminar flow is, let's say the flow cell looks a little bit more complex. What we have is, again, our sheath tank down here where we have our compressed sheath fluid in there in a laminar fashion, and we're introducing this actually into our cuvette. Now, we're creating the laminar flow up in front here, and at some point, we're injecting our single cell suspension into the whole system. Now, as the sheath fluid has a much larger volume than the sample that we're injecting into the system, what we're generating is a focusing function also in here. First of all, we're focusing the sample in, in time because it's moved along the sheath stream, which has the larger volume. But additionally to that, we're also creating, because we're in a canal system, in this case, a crystal quartz cuvette, we're having an interaction between our lamina sheath stream with the borders of the cuvette. At this moment, what happens here is a little bit of minuscule friction that actually happens here, resistance. So if we draw a little bit over dramatize the speed profile in here, what you can see is that at the edges of our flow cell, we have slightly reduced flow in terms of the speeds. And this is actually getting a little bit faster in the middle. So what we get is that the speed is less perturbed in the middle. So any kind of particle that we would inject into the flow would automatically line up in the middle of our stream. Very similar to what you see on a river if you let the boat go loose. So with this principle, so-called hydrodynamic focusing, we're now creating actually a fluid system that drives our cells forward at a very discrete pace. It always has the same speeds and we're focusing our sample into the middle. So at this moment, we have a perfect system that we can tune optics into. Flow cytometry is dependent actually on excitation. Anything that we can excite and generate a fluorescence from in a cellular format, we can actually analyze. So we can tune our systems by putting in very strong lasers of different wavelengths to create a variety of ex excitation uh, potential that can actually fit to any kind of question if we have a dye that reports it in terms of fluorescence. Now, in conventional flow cytometers, we use lasers because first of all, they're coherent, they're very focused in their, uh, in their light, and they're also very easy to actually put into the instruments. Now, flow cytometer, what it does is, in the end, it turns 
the number of fluorescent photons that are emitted in our system into a discrete electrical value. And I want to explain you how this actually works and how this happens in the instrument. So coming back, actually, we have our fluid setup. We have our flow curvette here. And into this flow curvette, we're now actually introducing our laser. Now, if we have an optical instrument coming in, our laser is perfectly tuned in on the middle of the stream where we have our uh, excitation maximum in here we can already start to detect the first parameter that a flow cytometer can generate, which is of course scattering of fluorescent light. Now the scattering of fluorescent light is actually detected by a forward scatter detector. Usually this is a diode, photodiode in this case. And not to blind our photodiode actually with the primary laser light, what we do is we actually have a so-called obstruction bar of it that blocks away the primary laser light. So how does that work? Now cells are in principle very insensitive towards light. Most of the light actually passes through the cell. But some of the light will actually interact with the cell if it moves through our laser beam. And that is because we have different optical densities in our cells. We have vesicles that have slightly different content in there. We have a nucleus which could interact with lights and some kind of other cellular structures like the Golgi or the ER. All these structures will generate us some kind of a scattering. Now, scattering itself is omnidirectional. The thing here is, it really scatters into every direction, but what we're doing is, we're picking up the light just actually in the direction of the laser beam, which we obstruct with our obscuration bar here. But what we do is, we're taking only a very small proportion of this light that we could actually analyze. And usually this is between 10 and 20 degrees of an angle. So if light that is scattered here actually hits our detector, we're generating a signal proportional to its scattering intensity. Now, as I said, the light is scattered omnidirectional, so we don't only have just a forward scatter signal that we're generating, but we're also generating a side scatter signal. And a side scatter signal is actually the way in most instruments that we take this is directly in a 90 degrees orthogonal direction to the primary laser light. This is very simple to build and is also very precise in the end. So one thing that we have to think about is is that light scattering activity depends a lot on the cell's optical density and its makeup. Also on its roughness, because also membrane protrusions and everything can induce some more scattering to it. And to a certain extent also its size, but not predominantly its size. This is all a merging function together. One last thing before we go into fluorescence, just to be clear about this. Scattering really is depending on the primary laser light. So we're not measuring any kind of fluorescence. So these signals are usually very strong and very intense and easy to pick up. If we look at scatter plots, and this was uh, something that was really nice when the people started actually to work with flow cytometry, of course, one of the first samples that they worked with was blood. And if we look at a blood forward and side scatter here, we can already discriminate a couple of different cell types in here. For example, we can discriminate the lymphocytes down here with a low forward and side scatter. Then we have the monocytes in here, slightly more increased in the side scatter, a little bit more forward scatter signal, as well as the granulocytes with had a large side scatter. Now this is very nicely and very discriminate towards already certain cell types, not really specific, but sort of quite discriminate to this. If we would look at the, let's say, organ tissue preparation, which we created into single cell suspension by digestion, we can already see that the scatter is becoming more ambiguous. Of course, we can already see some lymphocytes down here again, a couple other smaller cells lining up, but in the end, the scatter is becoming more complex. The same thing is if we look at uh, scatters from cell culture cells, this is usually relatively homogeneous, but also quite broad and can have a quite larger spreading function depending on how the health of your cells. Um, we see here the healthy cells in principle. Over here, we can already see some dead cells coming up, usually seen and described with a larger side scatter and smaller forward scatter. But in flow cytometry, we don't only just analyze scatters. That is, we are a multidimensional uh, tool. So what we're trying to use most of the time is a fluorescent tech to, to analyze some kind of viability stains, any kind of biochemical properties of a cell, or in principle of using antibodies, we can phenotype them. And most people actually use flow cytometry for phenotyping. And in this case, let's base our explanations on this. So in case of classical cytometry, we're using uh, antibodies which are specific uh, to antigens on the cell surface, or actually also in the intracellular space of the cell. And we stain them up with 
specific fluorophores that will conjugate to this antibodies. So every antibody carries its own specific fluorescence. If we think about this, we can turn actually our antibodies into discrete colors. For example, antibody 1 would have a FITC, antibody 2 a PE, and in this case, antibody 3 would have a PE psi 7. Now, I chose this example because all of these dyes are nicely excitable from a 488 laser at the same time. So from a 488 laser, what we can do is we can actually excite and we can record a possible emission spectrum from 489 up to the end of the visible spectrum or actually a little bit above it if we would take infrared stains as well into this. So our dyes that we have here and our antibodies actually spread perfectly in here with FITSI being predominantly green, PE being yellowish and PE psi 7 being bright uh, in, in the far reds. With fluorescent dyes, and I think this has already been shown in all the microscopy slides, uh, the one thing that we have is fluorescence is not 100% perfect because our fluorophores are emitting light predominantly in the color that we assign to them. So FITSI predominantly emits in the green colors, but it also has a function that some of the photons that emits are actually also yellowish or reddish. So what we need to do in our instruments is we have to tune our individual detectors to actually pick up the maximum signal from them. So let's get to this. So first thing that we're going to do now right now is we'll pass our cell that is stained with the antibodies and we'll pass them through our laser. At this moment, the instrument detects first of all the forward scatter. It will also pick up the side scatter in these collimator lenses where it also picks up our fluorescence. But what we can do right now, what you can do in microscopy, is we can't have sequential exposure of our cells. We have to measure all the dyes, all the fluorescence at the same time. So what we do now is we take our individual detectors, we tune them in and say, okay, detector one, I'm going to put in front of it a bandpass filter 51020, which makes it specific towards FITSI signal, yeah, which is green. I take one that is specific towards PE with a 58542 filter in this case. And in case of the PE, be a PE psi 7, it's already at the end of the spectrum. In this case, we don't have to use a bandpass filter per se. We could also introduce just a long pass filter. But again, we're making this detector specific for the signal. So if we're making our detectors already specific for it, we also have to section up the fluorescence into proportions that reflect in the end also bandpasses. So we have to slice the light into different sections that we then feed to the individual detectors. And the way how we do this is actually we're using dichroitic long and short pass filters. Let's take you through this. And in the example, what we're going to take now is we have to cut apart, actually, let's say in the first instance, the light from the PSI 7. Now in this case, we would introduce a dichroitic mirror in here, which is a short pass for 630 nanometers. That means any light that is shorter than 630 nanometers will be transmissible through this filter. Anything that is of longer wavelengths, of course, will be reflected from this filter into a different direction. So if we now actually dissolve this and actually look at what it looks like in the instrument, what we can see is that this all comes into play. In the first case, as I said, our dichroitic for the 630 slices off the red proportion of our light that was, hitting, that was coming through our uh, collimator lenses. After this, the next section that we're going to have is towards our PE detector. Now, PE is in the orange wavelength, so what we're going to do is we're going to put in here a dichroitic long pass filter at this moment. So anything longer than 550 will come through and will actually add up into our PE detector once it passes through the uh, specific bandpass filter. And the same thing then again holds true forwards the FITSI detector where we slice it down and also of course for our side scatter detector because the primary fluorescent laser light was also coming through and we needed to detect the side scatter signal for our cells. Now what is actually the instrument seeing at this moment? If our cells actually entering our laser beam, passing through it and exiting it, we're creating a pulse. In this case, in the first instance, of course, it's a pulse of photons arriving at our detectors. Now, this photon pulse is then converted into an electrical signal in our instrument. Some instruments, or let's say most of the instruments, are still using PMTs for this. Very reliable, very good and nice in detection. Some machines already are using avalanche diodes, and other instruments can also use CCD cameras. They all have in common that they transform a number of photons, so to say the photon parts, very faithfully into 
a current pulse from which we can digitize data. We can measure off the height or the area of the pulse signal as well as the signal width. So we're creating very discrete and machine readable data from this. Now in the end, if we're creating a voltage pulse, we have a certain let's say, sensitivity range what our instrument can see. And in very, let's say in most instruments, this is between zero volts up to five or 10 volts. So what we now have to do is we have to slice this data into meaningful sections, making so-called channels for our fluorescence. Let's visualize this, this concept. So if we have here two peaks of slightly different intensity, you can see peak number one is slightly higher, peak number two has a slightly lower signal. And we would actually have a one bit resolution in our instrument. We can only differentiate between low or no to mid signal and mid to high signal. That would not be enough to actually differentiate between the two. They would probably just come up and say like, hey, we're brighter. If we would now use a system that already has a 4-bit resolution scale, which means 8-bit per se, we could already say, okay, both of these uh, signals that came into our instrument are somewhere in the higher mid-range of signal activity. So they would take channel number 5 in this case. But again, we would not be able to differentiate between the two, this little difference between the two uh, cells that actually pass through, but this is what we want. We want to enumerate them. So what we have to ensure is that our instruments actually have a so-called resolution that is good enough to differentiate between smaller differences in amounts of the reported electrical current signal. So in this case, if we would already apply a 10-bit resolution, which is 1024 channels available to section our voltage signals into, we would now be able to actually differentiate between them and could say, okay, particle, let's say particle one had a slightly higher particle, had a higher fluorescence than particle number two. Now, to be fair, most instruments today have quite better resolution in terms of their voltage channeling. We're talking about 100,000 channels, maybe even millions of channels. Now, the thing is, this does not really say how sensitive an instrument is in terms of resolving small differences in reported fluorescence activity. Here, really, the electronics, the optics, the so-called quantum efficiency and the background noise are paramount to this. So if somebody comes to you and says, hey, use an instrument with a higher resolution, so let's say a million channels, will not give you the guarantee that you can perfectly separate very, very slightly different signal intensities. For this, you need a perfectly optically tuned and low noise system. And unfortunately, every flow cytometer is slightly different. You have to test this out. Well, with this little excourse to the detail, so flow cytometer, what it does in the end, it's a very fast instrument. So we pass thousands and thousands of uh, cells or, or particles through it per second. And the instrument actually records all the data from each individual pulse that actually came in here at a certain resolution in terms of uh, voltage uh, channeling that we have and puts this in the end into a so-called list mode data file, the flow cytometry data standard format. And in the end, this list mode file contains pretty much the event identifier, where did it come up, the first event, the second event, the third event, a time to this, the functions of uh, side scatter activity and forward scatter activity, as well as all the other fluorescent channels and values that were recorded along to it. So in the end, you have a huge spreadsheet that you can analyze. So when I said in the beginning, a flow cytometer is very similar to a very high and speedy accountant, this is actually true. It's a voltmeter that really notes down the individual voltages very, very fast. Now, I already mentioned, if we now go and actually try to use a flow cytometer to dissolve different uh, cell populations and using fluorescence for this, we have to deal with a certain function that I was already introducing before. If we look now in this example, which we're going to focus in, in the next couple of slides, we're going to look at an antibody against CD3, which is labeled with FITC, CD8 with PE, and CD4 with PE psi 7. Now these surface antigens here that we're doing with, they denote actually the, lympho uh, the lymphocyte lineage, and then as well the T helper for the CD4s and the T cytotoxic T cells with the CD8. But what I want to come up with is something different. Because, as I said already, fluorescence from these dyes is never 100% specific. We have 
an emission spread that we actually see. So if we look at FITSI again, we can see, yes, it predominantly shines off in the green emission ranges, but it also has a couple of its photons that it emits also of longer wavelength and would actually end up in our PE channel. But they do not come from PE, but they actually come from uh, FITSI. Now, this is the nature of fluorescence. It's just imperfect. We have these statistical values to it. And what we do in cytometry in this case to mitigate this is we do compensation. So we calculate the overall spillage of the FITC signal into the PE channel. So how do we do this? And it's a very simple example here. What I have here are beads that are stained with FITC alone. And we have beads that are completely unstained. What you can see already is that, of course, the FITC beads in their own primary channel have a very high signal. We see them with a median fluorescence of channel close to 16,000. Whereas the, the beads that were unstained, we have them here with a, negative, with a mean of channel 13. So they're very dim at this moment. But you can already see here that the FITSI is also apparently detected in our PE channel. And that is because it's also emitting, as I said, photons in the wavelength range, which actually is recorded in our PE channel. So what we can do is we can enumerate this. And we see in the PE channel, we record something like 3,000 median of its fluorescence intensity and 10 on the negative beads. So in the end, what we do is, is we do a linear subtraction. So we, create, we calculate a compensation value to this. And the way how we do this is we take the median spillage of FITSI and detect it in the PE channel, record this in here, subtract the median of the negative beads here in the PE channel, and divide this with the same function here for the my primary FITSI channel. So what we get in the end is if we put the numbers in, it's a percentage value. And now this gives us a nice way to interpret how much spillage do I actually have. Now in this case, we had the spillage of 20.67%. Now, how do I apply this? If I go back to my FITSI beads, and I calculate that I have roughly a, a median fluorescence intensity on these uh, beads of 16,000. What I now do is I take 20.76 of this value, percent of this value, and subtract this value actually in the PE channel. This way, I'm not interfering with the original intensity of my FITSI channel, but I'm trying to correct for this. If I do this, we're actually moving back together the median of the unstained in the PE channel as well as the positive FITSI beats in the PE channel without losing the intensity of our FITSI signal. However, let's be fair about this. What you can see here is we're introducing a so-called data spread into this. And this is very simple to explain. We're using a one-size-fits-all approach towards compensation because it's a linear subtraction. That means not every FITC particle had the same inefficiency of generating green light and having putting out uh, orange light instead. So we will have some particles coming through with a slightly better or slightly less uh, spillage into this, but we apply a similar compensation to them. So this is why we're spreading out this population here. Now, data spread is something that we commonly use to in flow cytometry, and we're very aware about this. So when you see data coming out from this, please be assured this is considered into our gating strategies. So in case we have a multicolor in there, let's say actually we have a PE and a FITSI beads inside, and we want to compensate PE and FITSI together. Well, the same way what we do it, individual stained beads, we'll calculate the compensation that we have to apply and actually put this on top of our data. So what we're creating is so-called compensation matrix, and this compensation matrix in the end is applied to all the events that we have recorded into our analyzer. Now on an analyzer, it's much nicer. If you see a deficiency in here, you can always change the compensation value and make it slightly better. But honestly, if you can motivate them directly when you actually measure them, it's probably the best that you can do. So with this, we're actually starting to look a little bit more into real data. So we're coming back actually to our forward and side scatter picture from the blood. Now already I said down here in this population, we pretty much have the lymphocytes residing in. And as I said before, we can stain up lymphocytes with a common marker, which is CD3, the common lymphocyte marker. So if we look at our, uh, at our data here without any kind of gating down to it and just enumerate the numbers of CD3 positive cells and would gate these back actually onto our forward scatter just as 
the principle to explain and demonstrate this, we would get out just these small cells that I said, hey, there are predominantly lymphocytes in this population. Now, as I said, more flow cytometry is not really just single, motor, single dimension analysis, but what we are really doing is multidimensionality. So let's get started with this in an easy fashion. Let's take, again, we have our three antibodies around, CD3, CD4, and CD8. In the first dimension, I would actually look at my scatter and I would say, hey, I'll take a side scatter just because that's nice and I plot against it the CD3 signal. So we can already separate out the lymphocytes in this case. Now, I can make a subgate on these lymphocytes and I could say, okay, please tell me how many CD4s and CD8 cells are actually in here. So if we do this, we're looking now at the enumeration. We see the CD4 positives coming up here. We can say we have closely, well, 64% of CD4 positive cells in here compared to for the cytotoxic T cells, which are CD8 positive, roughly 7.5%. A couple other events that we do that we have in the gate that are not denominated in here. So what we can do with flow cytometry is we can go really big numbers into this and very easily because we can analyze millions and millions of cells in very short time. But we don't only do this at a dimensionality of three but we actually do it much larger. Some people do 25, 30 different colors by now. So if we look actually now at an example, we go back to the blood and we now say what we're gonna to apply to it is a 10 color panel. Um, what we can see from this is if we start out in the beginning again and actually put a couple more dimensions into our analysis, what we do is now the following thing. Let's say we take our, un, uh, our ungated blood in here and we say, hey, I'm looking at the amount of CD3 positive lymphocytes in here, or actually at the amount of B cells. This is the first level of analysis that I do. I select that these are my primary markers because they denote me very different cell types very easily. I can then continue again and denote the CD4 versus CD8 content. But as I have now a couple more interesting markers for me in here, maybe I'm interested actually at the number of t rex in my sample, which are coming up from the CD4 gate, what I can do now is using a couple of different cell surface markers, for example, CD127 versus CD25 in this case, I can enumerate now the Treg cells because the Treg cells will be high on CD25, but slightly lower on CD127. So I can draw a gate around them and enumerate them. But because I have a couple lot more antibodies in my panel, I can also look at different cell types now, actually. So I could go into my original cell now, uh, plot here where I have no subgating beforehand. What I can do now is I can actually look at the double negative cells. And if I take the double negative cells and then say, hey, how many DCs are in there? Because DCs are stayed up by HLADR to some large extent. I could go again for a different level. I could say, okay, how many are in there? And then I could go to the second level, so to say the third dimension, and actually look at the number of CD11Cs versus CD123 positivity in these samples. And this way I could denote that I have close to 93% of myeloid disease in my sample and very few plasma satoid disease cells. Now this is all very specific towards immunology. But this kind of cladistic gating and analyzing at multidimensional levels is absolutely the key for flow cytometry and one of the best technologies to do this. And just to think about this, because I mean, I took very specific markers and I'll show you very specific subplots. If we would just look at 10 antibodies in this case, we can already calculate that we would curve more than, or we would have 90 potentially different bivariate plots that we could analyze. Now this means only bivariate plots, but we could look at all markers at the same time to do a completely unsupervised, unclustered analysis. And this is actually where flow cytometry at the moment is going. We're becoming more and more like the genomics, proteomics fields where huge amounts of data in different specificities and, and, and channels are analyzed. And it's the same thing, multidimensionality is there and we have to deal with it. And this is what we do now with flow cytometry. Now you could say, hey, Malta, you showed me 10 different dyes. How do you make sure that you get specifically 10 different dyes out if you already told me about spectral overlap? How can you force 10 different dyes on the same similar laser line? To be honest, we don't. In flow cytometry, what we're using are spatially separated lasers. So we have multi-laser instruments. And as I told you in the beginning, we have lamina flow in our system. That means we have a very discrete 
traveling time between distances. So if we specially separate a laser, for example, we take the first laser, the blue laser, and some certain distance down in our flow cell where uh, we're lining in our violet laser in this case, we could make sure that the traveling time between the two lasers is always constant. For example, here 40 mi 47 microseconds and so on for the other lasers. So what I could do now is I could have many different antibodies on my cells, but they're specifically excited by different lasers. So in this case, what I do is, as I showed you, I have multiple detection boards and emission boards, like what we showed you for the blue laser, but actually coming up from different lasers. This, of course, frees the spectrum, reduces spectral overlaps, and we're actually generating higher parameter data much, much easier. In the end, all the individual results actually coming off here from our individual lasers are summarized in the list mode file so that we make sure that we know what signal came off from one cell and each every different laser. And the way how this actually looks this is coming off from one of my instruments where I run three lasers in parallel here on oscillograph. What you can see is that this is really nicely time resolved and very, very stable due to the point that we have a laminar flow system. The fluidics save us at this case. Well, with this, just a short summary, because let's say, how fast is this field developing? Lasers are becoming cheaper. The companies are putting a lot of tremendous work into creating different fluorescent dyes for different lasers to increase the specificity. Since I was born, actually, in the early 80s, systems there were lucky to have one or two lasers and were able to measure some three or four parameters. Until the time that I got really into professional work in this case, we were already at five laser systems and we're now actually at four to nine laser instruments that are running off plus 25 different detectors. And the field is really developing. It's getting faster and faster. There's also alternative technologies there or technologies merging with each other. Genomics and flow cytometry are getting more and more actually in a combinatorial use. So where is the, the, the let's say, the journey actually heading? It's kind of difficult to say. I have to admit more and more is coming towards imaging flow cytometry. We see the beauty of this. There's a lot of dimensionality in images if we can get them as well. So I would say dimensionality which is just increase in the next couple of years and dramatically. Well, with this, I hope you enjoyed the seminar. There's a little bit of downstream literature if you were interested in what I just told you today. We actually have Howard Shapiro's book here. This is already a little bit older here, but still very valid. Uh, the book really explains the principles of flow cytometry very well. It's a really good resource. If you're interested in protocols to work with towards flow cytometry, I think a good starter is the book from the Hollies. It's very good and well written, but there's many, many different books out there if you need more specific uh, examples to look at for protocols. And one last thing, because it's a very recent uh, paper actually published by friends of mine. They did a great work. This was actually published in the European Journal of Immunology. They summarize all the basics that have to be thought about when you want to do flow cytometry experiments and cell sorting experiments. And this paper is really well written with lots and lots of guides towards secondary literature and I can only say enjoy it. Well, with this, thank you very much for your attention and for joining into iBiology and I hope to see you again. Bye-bye.